Thank you. Um, so I want to come on now to uh, George Young, Lord Young of Cookham, um, who has been in and around politics for a while. Um, first came into Parliament in, uh, she said politely, in uh, 1974 for, as MP for Ealing Acton, then was in uh, uh, the representative for North West Hampshire uh, until 2015. And uh, George had been a, a minister in the Thatcher years and the major years, including in health, in housing and the Treasury. And of course, in the last Parliament was uh, leader of the House of Commons and uh, chief whip. So. Uh, what's your sort of perspective on all of this, more from sort of sitting at the centre right. and in-house? Well, congratulations on producing this very important archive. I think the first thing I'd say is there are lessons here for the civil service as well as for ministers. Some of the stories we heard about the chaos when people arrived, there are lessons there for the civil service. I think the second thing to say is that in, in the last parliament, I was a, a usual channel, a business manager, either leader of the house or chief whip. Therefore, I have a slightly different perspective in that those jobs are very different from running a departmental uh, ministry. On the other hand, what the Chief Whip is doing is uh, judging ministers um, who have got the right skills. So when it comes to reshuffle, um, you, you can identify for, for the Prime Minister who are the ones who are struggling a bit. And also you're looking at your backbenchers to see which are the ones who've got the necessary skills uh, to manage a portfolio. I had a, a sort of similar experience to Jeremy. When, I, w when we formed the coalition, the Prime Minister called me in and said, George, I want you to be a leader of the House of Commons and Lord Privy Seal. I said, that's fine. Uh, both of which had always been cabinet jobs. And about an hour later, there was a phone call. Frightfully sorry, we've um, miscounted. <laughs> and we, we, you can only have, was it 22 cabinet ministers? And because of the Lib Dems, uh, we're one over the top. So George, would you frightfully mind being, <laughs> <coughs> would you frightfully mind being a Minister of State? Well, there's, there's not really any other answer to that, then of course I don't mind. <laughs> <coughs> and so there was that confusion within the, the, the Cabinet Office. And anyone here from the Cabinet Office um, who was keeping the score as the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister appointed um, folk to the, to the job? Um, I, the, the, one of the things I'd say is ministerial skills are not static. Uh, you kindly said I've been around a long time. Um, when I became a minister in 1979, there were hardly any spads. Uh, there was no Westminster Hall, um, Parliament was, wasn't televised, uh, there were no uh, select committees, uh, there was no social media. So the skills you needed as a minister then are very different to the ones you need now. And I said that just to make the point that what you're doing should not be static, in that looking ahead, the portfolio of skills a minister may need may change as the society in which we work changes. And also I think different prime ministers have different styles. And therefore, the skills that a minister may need may change with the prime minister. For example, Gordon Brown had a very different style of government to uh, Tony Blair. Uh, phone calls and the very small hours of the morning from Gordon was not Tony's style. So again, I think that is one of the variables that you need to um, uh, fill in. There are some core skills. Um, you've simply got to understand public expenditure. Uh, that you've got to follow very closely the bilaterals with the Treasury, understand what's above the line, what's below the line, whether it's real, whether it's cash, all the rest, um, whether you can get some of it scored as a PFI. You've really got to be up to speed uh, with, with the intricacies of your departmental budget. Um, it, it used to happen every year, now it happens every, every parliament. So you still need those skills, absolutely um, uh, crucial. As we've heard, you've got to be on top of your uh, brief. You, you've really got to be up to speed and have, if not in your mind, at least in your wallet, uh, the, key, the key facts and figures relative to your uh, department. Uh, managing the diary. Nothing should go in to the diary without the Minister uh, approving it. None of these automatic, well, the Secretary of State has always done this annual dinner, therefore we've put it in the diary. Yeah, you've got to keep a very close grip on, on that. And also make sure you've got enough space for the constituency and the family. Uh, it's important that the families shouldn't pay too heavy a price for ministerial uh, commitment. On career development, ideally, and it's not always possible, uh, a minister should have spent some time in the whip's office and some time in the treasury. Now, obviously, you, you can't do it. But time in the whip's office in the House of Commons is invaluable in seeing how the place runs, getting to know the business managers, uh, getting to know all your colleagues, and also some time in the treasury. The, the treasury going to say the Treasury runs the government. Um, uh, obviously, different chancellors have different styles, but if, if you're in the Treasury, you get a very good bird's eye view of what's going on in the whole of the government, and also understand the mentality and culture of the Treasury. 
which is slightly different from other departments. So ideally, uh, a minister, if possible, should spend some time on the way through. Then um, cabinet subcommittees, um, you've really got to take those uh, seriously. R around the, the table will be some of the sort of sharpest operators in Whitehall. And uh, one minister came to PBL, Parliamentary Business and Legislation, trying to persuade us that this was a seriously important bill. And actually, he was not up to speed. He did not know the details. He couldn't answer the questions. And so that bill uh, was dropped from the programme. And a lot of the serious work takes place in cabinet subcommittees. And there, you've really got to be up to speed. And <clears throat> what, you, what you don't want to do is read out your departmental brief. Um, obviously, you've got to know what it is. But the best thing is, by all means, have notes. But what you want to do is talk to your colleagues in your own words and explain why this particular measure is, is important, or indeed if it's, if it's in cabinet, uh, why your view is one that should uh, prevail. But the moment people start reading out the departmental brief, I'm, brief, I'm afraid a lot of colleagues just you know, switch off, uh, and it's very important that you get on top of that. Um, we've got a much more assertive House of Lords. I think ministers have really got to, and some, some members here, uh, they've really got to pay more attention than certainly when I first became a minister to the House of Lords. Um, I think we're losing, is it 70, 80% of the votes at the moment in the House of Lords? And so a minister, whether or not he's a Lords Minister, has got to have a strategy for managing, um, managing the Lords, uh, keeping back some of the concessions for the Lords, not doing them all in, in the Commons to safeguard the legislative um, programme. Um, special advisors, there are many more. The, the, the special advisor who stays in my mind is Nick Hardwick, who at the time we appointed him, was working for Centrepoint. And rough sleeping was a real issue. And so Nick became a special advisor. And he had no history of ever working with my party. I never asked him how he votes. Uh, he's now HM Inspector of Prison. But it was, it was fantastic having someone like that who really understood rough sleeping from the point of view of the voluntary organisations, working for two years with ministers, helping to develop a, 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 a policy. So, one shouldn't always go for spads who have shown loyalty to your particular party. You should think laterally and get people who really know their subject, who have credibility in the area, and try and persuade them to work for, for, for the government, even if it's, if it's not a government who shares their um, uh, affiliation. Um, and finally, no surprises. Absolutely right. Um, the, the last thing number 10 want to hear is um, that court case which you're... You know, the departmental lawyers told you it was 90%, 99% certain that the Supreme <laughs> Court would find on, uh, would, and, and then blame me down. Uh, you're told that a particular judge who they hadn't expected took the case. Um, and so you always tell number 10 um, if, if something might go wrong, even if it doesn't. They don't like to be, uh, as you said, uh, taken by surprise. So those are some sort of footnotes to this fantastic archive that you've been working on. Over the past few months. Uh, excellent top tips for any budding politicians in the room. Um